In this video, we'll be covering the setup process for the LumiBoost LED driver from Stratus LEDs. But first, a quick overview of what the LumiBoost is. High power LED chip on board arrays are awesome. They are extremely bright, efficient, and compact. The downside is that they can be a bit finicky. They typically require high input voltages and a powerful cooling system, as well as a current regulated power source to prevent them from drawing too much current and burning themselves out. This is where the LumiBoost comes in. It provides the LED with a regulated current source and thermal management features such as fan control and temperature monitoring. At its core, the LumiBoost is a DC to DC boost converter. This means it takes a lower DC voltage and boosts it up to a higher DC voltage. This is advantageous for high power LEDs because they typically require high voltages to operate. The output voltage will always be greater than the input voltage. The LumiBoost also offers over-voltage and over-current protection for the LED, where it will cut off the output when either the voltage or current rises above a selectable safety threshold. This feature can protect against short-circuit and open-circuit conditions on the LED output. In addition to a powerful boost converter, the LumiBoost also has a powerful microcontroller on board, which enables it to read several types of input signals for dimming control. This includes analog voltage, RC servo-style PWM, DMX, and ArtNet DMX through the optional ESP01 Wi-Fi module. With all these features, it's safe to say the LumiBoost is one of the most versatile LED drivers on the market. Now let's dive into the setup process. Before we get started, keep in mind that the LumiBoost is capable of generating high voltages, so it's wise not to touch it while powered on. It also has plenty of exposed metal that would be easy to short circuit, so keep it away from anything conductive such as a metal table. Also, be aware that you should not turn on the LED output without proper heat sinking on both the LED emitter and the LumiBoost. In this tutorial, my LumiBoost and LED are not set up for proper heat sinking, but that's okay in this case because I'll only be turning on the LED for a few seconds at a time, so nothing will be able to overheat. We recommend using the proper heat sinks at all times so that you don't have to worry about this. There will be more information on heat sinking later in this video. Before we get started with configuring the LED drive, we'll need to install the LumiBoost Configurator PC application. It can be downloaded from the LumiBoost page on the Stratus LEDs website. Step 1. Configuring the LED drive. This step should be done before you ever connect power to the LumiBoost to avoid accidentally damaging your LED by overdriving it. Plug the LumiBoost into your computer via a micro USB cable and open the LumiBoost Configurator software. If the software does not automatically connect, select the correct COM port and click Connect. If the connection was successful, the USB status icon will be green, and you'll see some of the live telemetry values dancing around. If the USB status is green but you don't see any telemetry values changing, make sure the telemetry stream is turned on with this button. This is a good time to check the Stratus LEDs website and the LumiBoost manual for any available firmware updates. The firmware updating process will be covered later in this video. Now it's time to set up the LED drive settings. You'll need to know the max current rating and forward voltage rating of your LED emitter. These can be found in the spec sheet provided by the manufacturer. For a list of all known compatible LED emitters, check the LumiBoost manual. Set the max output current to whatever is listed on the spec sheet. This is the most important parameter. Setting it too high will overdrive and potentially burn out your LED. Every time you change a value, click right to save it to the LumiBoost. Set the output voltage clamp to 20 to 30% higher than the forward voltage rating of the LED. For example, if your LED is rated for 32 volts, set this parameter to 38.4 volts. This feature can protect against open circuit conditions on the LED output. Do note that the output voltage clamp does not control the output voltage of the LumiBoost. It's just a safety feature that cuts off the output if the voltage rises above the specified value. When this happens, it's shown in the telemetry stream as a V-out high fault. If you ever get a V-out high fault during normal use, you can try raising the output voltage clamp a bit. Keep in mind that the LumiBoost does not actually control its output voltage, it just naturally rises to match the forward voltage of the LED. Set the output current clamp to 20-30% to higher than the max current rating of the LED. For example, if your LED is rated for 4 amps, set this parameter to 4.8 amps. This feature can protect against short circuit conditions on the LED output. This is another protection feature that cuts off the output if the current climbs above the specified value. This is shown in the telemetry stream as an I-out high fault. 
it may need to be manually raised if you get overcurrent faults during normal use. During all faults, the LED will flash three times, then it will reset the fault and try to restart every 10 seconds. If the fault condition persists, the LED might briefly flash as it tries to restart. Setting it to auto calculates the value automatically based on your max current setting. Once all these parameters are configured, you can connect to the LED and plug in your power source. Make sure your power source is capable of handling the high current draw. Once power is connected, the LED should turn on at 100% brightness, assuming you haven't changed any of the control input settings from their defaults. Don't leave the LED powered on for too long without the fan configured. We'll set that up next. In order to turn off the LED without powering down the LumiBoost, enable the switch input. Note that this overrides all the other inputs, so you'll need to disable it when you're ready to turn the LED back on. To utilize all the fan control functions of the LumiBoost, a fan with PWM speed control should be used. The fan output has a voltage regulator that can be set to either 10 or 12 volts. When it is set to 12 volts, the fan voltage will dip below 12 when the input voltage is under 13.5. This usually isn't a problem, but if you want to keep the fan voltage consistent regardless of the input voltage, then set it to 10 volts. This can be done by jumping the JP1 solder pads on the bottom side of the board. There are three fan modes. Always on will keep the fan at the max fan PWM percentage at all times. Auto load scales the fan speed from min fan PWM while the LED output is at 0% to max fan PWM while the LED output is at 100%. If you are using a thermistor, the auto therm mode will vary the fan speed between the min fan PWM and the max fan PWM in relation to the temperature range. This is useful for minimizing noise by preventing the fan from spinning faster than it needs to. Just for demonstration, notice how the fan spins faster when the thermistor heats up from the LED. If you're powering your LumiBoost off of lithium batteries, you can usually keep the low voltage cutoff set to auto. This automatically estimates the battery's cell count and sets the cutoff voltage accordingly. Notice how when I plug in 24 volts, a 6 cell battery is detected. Now, as I lower the input voltage, a VIN low fault is triggered. After 10 seconds, it will try to reset, and if the voltage is raised above the threshold, the fault will be cleared. The auto mode thresholds are as follows. In addition to 6 cell batteries, this works the same way for 3, 4, and 5 cell batteries. You can also set the low voltage cutoff manually, or just turn it off. Another great protection feature of the LumiBoost is thermal foldback. It requires the use of a thermistor to measure the LED temperature. Install the thermistor as close as possible to the junction between the LED emitter and the heatsink. It also works to install it inside the heatsink, as long as it is not too far from the LED emitter. When the measured temperature reaches the foldback start value, the LED will start to dim until the temperature reaches the foldback end temperature. At this point, the LED will be fully off, but it usually reaches some equilibrium point and rests there. Regardless of the types of thermal protection you're using, be sure your LED never exceeds the maximum operating temperature specified in the spec sheet. Aim for an operating temperature that's lower than this to prolong the lifespan of your LED. The LumiBoost itself also generates lots of heat and usually needs heat sinks and cooling fans for its own thermal management. These are the most thermally active components. Here are some examples of effective heat sinking configurations to give you an idea of what you'll need. Keep in mind that the LumiBoost produces more heat when using lower input voltages. For this reason, we recommend keeping the input voltage above 20 when using LEDs larger than 150 watts. Using LEDs above 200 watts is pushing the limits of the LumiBoost and is generally not recommended, although it has been tested up to 300 watts. For most applications in the 100 watt range, heat sinks like these along with some airflow are sufficient. Now that the LED drive is taken care of, we'll move on to configuring the control inputs. At this point, it's helpful to enable the switch input so that the LED stays off. 
Although the LumiBoost can read multiple kinds of control signals, it's recommended to only use one at a time. The exception to this is the switch input. It has priority over all the other inputs and can be used as a manual override or kill switch if needed. To trigger the switch input, simply connect the switch pin to 5 volts. If the polarity is set to normal, the LED will turn on when the switch pin is pulled high. When the polarity is set to reversed, the LED will be on by default and turn off when the switch pin is pulled high. Keep in mind that if you're trying to strobe the LumiBoost, it's best to turn off smoothing since it adds a delay. Next up is the analog voltage input. This is most commonly used for dimming control with a potentiometer. At this point, it's helpful to enable the switch input so that the LED stays off. Connect the 10K potentiometer to the control port and verify that the analog voltage reading in the telemetry section changes from roughly 0 to 5 volts as the potentiometer is moved to its extremes. Record the min and max analog voltages generated by your potentiometer. In the analogs input section, set the input min to about 0.02 .02 volts higher than the minimum voltage you observed. Set the input max to about 0.02 .02 volts lower than the highest value you observed. Moving the potentiometer to its extremes should now correlate to the analog demand ranging from 0 to 100%. Note that power should be connected to the LumiBoost while calibrating the analog voltage reading. If it's powered off USB alone, the analog voltage reading might be lower than normal. Next, we'll set up the RC input. This is used to dim the LumiBoost with any regular servo signal. Connect an RC receiver or a servo tester via the RC PWM cable. In this example, we'll be using an RC receiver connected to the throttle channel. Move the channel to the extremes and note the min and max pulse width values shown in the telemetry stream. Set pulse min to 2 microseconds higher than the lowest observed value. Set pulse max to 2 microseconds lower than the highest observed value. Moving the RC channel to its extremes should correlate to the RC demand ranging from 0 to 100%. Servo testers like this one can also be used for pulsating effects. It allows you to change the pulse duration with the knob, and the min and max values in the LumiBoost software can control the pulse endpoints. Again, to avoid unforeseen issues, disable all the inputs that you are not using. Next, we'll configure DMX. There are two main ways the DMX ports can be used. The first way is to use the LumiBoost just like any other DMX fixture. Just set the DMX mode to secondary, assign it a channel, and add it to your daisy chain with the GH to 5 pin XLR cables we sell. You can assign any channel to any LumiBoost at any point in the chain and control it individually. The second way to use the DMX port is for synchronizing multiple LumiBoosts in a daisy chained array. The first LumiBoost in the chain can use any other dimming signal input type other than DMX. Just set its DMX mode to primary and it will read the input signal, convert it into a single DMX channel, and forward that on to the rest of the LumiBoosts. The primary LumiBoost can also be used to configure the rest of the LumiBoosts in the chain at the same time. The forward LED config button passes along the LED drive values currently displayed in the configuration software to all the secondary LumiBoosts in the chain. The forward inputs config button passes along the control input values currently displayed in the configuration software to all the secondary LumiBoosts in the chain. Be careful not to accidentally set the DMX mode on all the LumiBoosts in the chain to primary. This will prevent them from receiving parameter change requests and you'll have to set each one back to secondary manually. Note that the config forwarding feature does not forward the settings saved on the primary LumiBoost, only the ones displayed in the configuration software. It also does not save any settings to the primary LumiBoost. Only the right button does that. The DMX functionality can also be changed to 16-bit where it will combine two channels worth of data into one for higher dimming resolution. If using 16-bit, all the LumiBoosts in the chain need to have it enabled. Notice how we now have 65,536 steps of DMX resolution with 16-bit enabled. 
With a normal 8-bit DMX signal, there are only 256 steps. The smoothing feature can be useful for reducing jitter when using an 8-bit DMX signal, or just smooth out the LED response for any of the input signals. Note that it should be turned off for strobing. A value of 2 or 3 is usually good for most applications. Here's a quick tip for those who might want wireless control of numerous Lumi boosts. These simple little DMX transceivers work great, and they are even compatible with most of the generic wireless DMX consoles out there, like this one. Here are some examples of useful configurations that include the DMX transceivers. The Wi-Fi settings can be left as is, unless you need to change the channel for use with multiple Lumi boosts, all connected to the same network. We'll cover Wi-Fi setup and app control in a separate video. Now that everything is configured, we can make a backup of these settings by saving them to a configuration file. It will be saved in a folder titled Settings that will be created in whatever location on your computer that the application lives. Configuration files can also be loaded into the software and written to the LumiBoost. Let's briefly talk about some of the other useful info we can get from the telemetry stream. The dimming level shows the commanded input value that the LumiBoost is reading from whichever control input source is active. The thermal foldback temperature reading shows the temperature measurement that is being used for fan control or thermal foldback. The percentage to the right of that shows the amount of influence that the thermal foldback is factoring into the LED output. The final LED output is displayed here. The Wi-Fi received, DMX received, and DMX transmitted values show the live data flowing through each of the inputs or outputs. DMX transmitted only shows the data that the LumiBoost sends when it is set to primary mode, and the dimming level is non-zero. The PWM value shows the duty cycle of the boost converter. The higher the value, the harder the LumiBoost is working, and the more it is having to boost the voltage. The latest LumiBoost firmware can be found on the LumiBoost webpage and in the manual. To update the firmware, First, make sure your LumiBoost is connected to the Configurator application. Next, click Hardware, Update Firmware, and then select the firmware file. The firmware update will take a few seconds. If successful, the LumiBoost will reconnect to the Configurator application. Next, power cycle the LumiBoost and continue the setup. Now that your LumiBoost is configured, you can use it for all sorts of high-powered LED applications, from action sports to drone lighting. For more information, check out the LumiBoost manual or contact us directly at stratusleds.com.